Good morning. I'm going to ask that everyone, uh, I know that this is an exciting time for everyone to catch up, but I'm going to ask that we take our seats so we can get our conference started on time. Um, as, we're, as you're taking your seats, I'll briefly introduce myself. I'll run through the agenda a little bit and talk a little bit about our, who I am and who our sponsors are as well. So my name is Dr. Howard Liu, and I'm a child psychiatrist, and I'm the director of the Behavioral Health Education Center in Nebraska. And our mission really is to create the future workforce and mental health for this state and also to train providers uh, in the most evidence-based treatments and practices. So really it's under the second auspices that we're here today in our third annual conference. Uh, in prior years, we've looked at primary care integration. We looked at the new DSM-5, the diagnostic manual. But this year, we're really excited to have this be a focus on schools as a system of care and how they relate to mental health as well. And so that's going to be our focus today. As I mentioned, uh, Beacon really is a workforce agency. So when you think of Beacon, which is spelled a little bit wonkily, I must admit, but uh, Behavioral Health Education Center, Nebraska, uh, think of us really as the uh, folks that, you know, we are the, the pipeline programs, and that's really what we do. And um, we really are, are folks that, you know, we do two things. We have these programs that bring students in, and so we have high school students that come from uh, rural Nebraska, uh, that meet in Kearney, we do a conference every year. We also have um, folks that, you know, conferences that we do for providers, and, such as this one. And we also have uh, conferences for college students and practicing professionals, and we try to mentor them as they get to the next stage. So here's just a, a brief slide about our impact and uh, where we've done throughout the state. And so far, uh, in this ambassador program, which is our key program for uh, integrating into the uh, future workforce, We've hit over about almost 600 students from 47 counties, and that's been growing just in the last few years. And we hope that you, as, as professionals, both in schools and in practice, can help us to recruit the next group as well. Uh, I'd like to briefly thank our sponsors, and uh, they've also been uh, scrolling through in, in the intro slides as well, and, and thank them so much for really being here to help us and, and to make this such an important conference for us. And, Actually, this is our first time really collaborating with so many special folks and uh, Building Healthy Futures, uh, ESU3, CHI Health, and uh, Child Savings Institute, the Kim Foundation, Murnau Meyer Institute, Nebraska Families Collaborative, Omaha Public Schools, Connections at Project Harmony, and the Community Counseling Program. So maybe just pause a moment and help me thank them for sponsoring with us. So. <clears throat> So, um, just to briefly introduce our agenda today, and it's also in your folders, but uh, I'll introduce the keynote speaker shortly, Sharon Hoover-Steven, and she's going to talk about national perspectives on school mental health. We'll have a break, during which time there's an exhibitor's fair next door, and we hope then that you take a look at that and see there's about 20 different exhibitors on aspects of mental health resources throughout the state. Uh, there'll be a panel as well uh, at 10.15, Nebraska School Mental Health Practices, and we're really going to highlight what are some outstanding programs here and have our keynoter, Dr. Sharon Hoover-Steven, talked about, you know, what, what are some perspectives that she's hearing around the country as well. We'll have a second break during which time we can also go to the Exhibitor's Fair. And then um, after that, um, we're going to move on to lunch, and we're going to give out our Beacon Awards. Uh, and there will be a, a brief uh, presentation from Public Health. They're uh, debuting a new video for students on, on stigma and mental health, and we hope that people can take a look at that and kind of give some feedback to them as they're rolling that piece out. Uh, there will be a, a second panel on collaboration and integration. And, and after that point, we're going to break out into workshops, and there will be about four concurrent workshops going on and we'll tell you where the, that will be. And there'll be a brief break at 2.30, followed by a second set of workshops around 2.45, and then we'll wrap up at 3.45. So that's gonna be our general agenda. So um, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, this conference does offer continuing education, and it's jointly provided by Creighton University Health Sciences, and um, we're excited by that. And, and folks, uh, please fill out your evaluations. That's gonna be important for you to get credit as well. And there's no conflicts of interest for any of our speakers today. So uh, just a bit, bit of brief housekeeping as well. Uh, if, you ha if you did bring a device, which many of us have, uh, the, the free conference, the Wi-Fi, is, uh, the username is Beacon. And the password is 
creatively. One, two, three, four. So beacon, you know, all in caps, one, two, three, four. I'm also, you know, making a valiant effort for us to tweet during this conference as well. So we've created a hashtag, Beacon2015. And uh, Steve, can you flash over to that for a sec? <clears throat> so uh, if you do have your phones or your Twitter devices or anything that's enabled, please post pictures, post comments, and that kind of stuff. And uh, you should be able to see that, and, and we'll pop those up. Right now, sadly enough, there are only five pictures taken by myself. So, uh, <clears throat> so you know, if you scroll down, there's, you know, there's Jill, our keynote speaker, Dan Schnoes from our organizing committee, you know, another picture, and, and, and some of our, our exhibitors here uh, next door as well. So we hope that you will also help us to supplement this living document of how our conference is going, and we're looking for that uh, feedback as well. So if you can flash back, Steve, that'd be great. Um, so I think those are, those are the main pieces, and you know, why schools and why mental health? Uh, so uh, Tom Freston once said, innovation takes two things that already exist and put them together in a new way, you know, and that's really what innovators do. And we have two massive systems and two areas that sometimes uh, lack resources, perhaps. Uh, sometimes we, we're always looking for new providers, uh, new, new teachers, and new personnel. So you know, these two areas really think that this is going to be a new frontier for us. This is going to be where many of you guys have been the, the, the entrepreneurs and, and really the, the pioneers that have blazed this trail. But you know, how can we make schools perhaps one of the new primary care homes? You know, how can we make sure that all, all school personnel from nurses to counselors to teachers to principals are, are trained in the basics of recognizing uh, common diagnoses like uh, depression or ADHD? How can we integrate them seamlessly into a system where there is access that isn't three months or six months down the line? You know, these are some of the challenges that we're going to face, not just here, but across the country. And so with that, we're really going to have some national perspectives and, of course, some best practices in the state. Now, it's really my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. It's uh, Dr. Sharon Hoover-Steven, who actually I met through a mutual friend uh, at a national council meeting. And she is really a, an amazing person, and uh, she does so many things. Uh, she is uh, a PI on 10 grants, she tells me, which if you're a researcher is remarkable. Uh, she is also the director of the Center for School Mental Health and has been the director since 2010. And they put on a, a national conference that draws over 1,000 people. Uh, this year it's going to be in New Orleans in September. And it really is focused solely on school mental health. And I, and I think you told me that this is the 20 year anniversary, is that right? So, so we are part of this national trend and, and it's really gonna be exciting. Uh, some of her background is expertise is in implementing empirically supported intervention in school-based settings. Uh, she specializes in research and training on evidence-based practices for mental health and also primary care staff in schools. She's involved in a number of research projects examining quality assessment and improvement in school mental health and she has a special interest in interventions for trauma-exposed youth as well. She's collaborated on and led multiple federal and state-funded grants, the 10 that I mentioned before, and she really has a commitment to the study and implementation of quality children's mental health services and school mental health. So really the data that we're looking at to say what's working the best and how can we share that across school districts. Uh, in terms of uh, Dr. Stevens' background, she had her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in 2002, and really we're just delighted to welcome her here. She is also a, a mother of three fantastic children, and uh, she, just as another side note, uh, she travels internationally. So she's worked in Ukraine, she's worked in South Korea after the ferry disaster where we lost all those high school students, and really it's a privilege to welcome her to Omaha. So please help me welcome Dr. Sharon hoover Steven. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here. Thank you, Howard, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I am so impressed with all that Beacon is doing, and I learned a lot more last night at a very, very kind welcome uh, dinner that was hosted by several of the Beacon community members. And I'm just 
quite impressed with all that's being done. I really see Dr. Howard Liu and Dr. Brent Kahn and all of their colleagues as being visionaries in the area of workforce development. And so I think we have a lot to learn from you all. And I'm very honored to be invited to talk with you today a little bit more about school mental health and the work that we do. So thank you for the welcome. I also want to acknowledge Jill Westfall and Ann Craft to have uh, been very uh, understanding with me as I sent them slides late and as I coordinated my travel. They were very gracious in all of their communication with me. So thank you for, for welcoming me and your kind remarks this morning. So I was asked to do quite a bit this morning, uh, and I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as I can, but Jill has made it clear to me that they'll be putting the slides on the Beacon website, so feel free to access those after I speak this morning. As Howard mentioned, I have no conflicts of interest for anything that I'll be talking about this morning, but I would like to acknowledge a number of folks who've contributed to the content of my remarks. So first, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge, first and foremost, my colleagues at the Center for School Mental Health. I'll be telling you a little bit more about our center, but I'd specifically like to thank my co-director, Dr. Nancy Lever, who I've worked with for about 15 years now, as well as Dr. Mark Wiest, who founded our center about 20 years ago. He's moved on to greener pastures in South Carolina, but his vision and his work continues to inform what we do at our center. I'd also like to thank my colleagues who are on the front lines in our school mental health program. So we operate as a community behavioral health partner to about 75 schools across Maryland, and the work that our clinicians are doing on a daily basis really helps to inform what we do at a national center. So I see it as a, a great collaboration with the front line at the local, state, and national level. And I used to work as a clinical psychologist in the schools for a number of years, uh, mostly in Baltimore City, and I miss that work dearly, so it's very nice to kind of stay in touch on a day-to-day -day basis with what's happening in the schools. I'd like to also thank my colleagues at the National Positive Behavior Intervention and Support Center. Some of their work is weaved throughout what I'll talk about today with respect to integrating mental health into multi-tiered systems of support. I'd like to thank our partners at the IDEA Partnership, which has been an umbrella organization for education entities around the country, and specifically Dr. Joanne Cashman, who's really taught us a lot about partnering across child-serving agencies, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that today because that's difficult work, but important work. And I, I loved Howard's quote, I'm going to steal that from you, that you have these two good things and putting them together really is what innovation is about. Uh, and finally, I'd always like to, to acknowledge my children because they keep me grounded in the work that we do and just the importance of creating safe and supportive schools uh, for all of our children. This is uh, my three kiddos enjoying one of our many snow days this year. They're finally out of school just as of a couple of days ago because we had to add on so many days at the end of the year. So just want to acknowledge them. So I, I had the pleasure of actually speaking with the executive committee and a number of folks on the planning committee for this meeting as we were talking about what could I actually address during this talk. A number of important questions came up. And so I was asked to answer several things about school mental health at a national level. And I'm going to do my very best to touch on at least each of these. So I'll give you probably a little of a lot. But my goal will be to also provide you with some resources and some access points that you can dig a little bit deeper after I finish my talk today. So I'll tell you about our Center for School Mental Health, as well as I'll, I'll provide a definition of school mental health and speak to the value of school mental health. So what does the research tell us about the impact of school mental health? I'll also talk about just how we effectively integrate mental health across what we might call a multi-tiered system of support in schools. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how do we uh, use empirically supported interventions in schools, how do we select the right students for the right interventions at the right time provided by the right people. I will touch on funding for school mental health. I actually have quite a bit of content in here on funding school mental health, but it's at the end, and I have a feeling I'll move quickly through it and then point you to a very good resource where you can dig deeper, as I said. And then I will end with two what I consider exciting opportunities, and this is your lure to stay awake. And as Howard mentioned, I've just come back recently from South Korea. I had the opportunity to go there three times in the last couple of years, and 
something, as I was speaking there, something funny happened that made me want to encourage audiences uh, to stay awake. So as we were speaking, I couldn't really figure, no, I'm just kidding. They, we were doing a relaxation exercise. With <laughs> so anyhow, they did not actually fall asleep. This was one of the most gracious audience I've ever had, actually. They were so attentive, and I've just incredibly enjoyed my time with them. Uh, but I do have two exciting opportunities at the end that I hope you will stay awake for uh, and be excited about as I share them with you. So let me just share a little bit about our National Center for School Mental Health. We were founded in 1995. We received funding from HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration. And within HRSA, we're specifically funded by the Maternal Child Health Bureau. As I mentioned, Dr. Mark Wiest founded our center, and it was really founded on a lot of the groundwork that was happening in Baltimore City with respect to partnering between community mental health and the education system. Uh, we focus on advancing school mental health policy, research, practice, and training. We have a number of grants and contracts, again, at the local, state, and national levels. And we talk often about having a shared agenda to support student mental health, and the shared agenda being between families, schools, and mental health, with the idea being that supporting student mental health really is the responsibility of all of those entities. I'll point you to a couple of resources that you can find related to our center. We have our center website where there are lots of goodies, and you can direct, uh, go directly to this link or just Google Center for School Mental Health. We also created a separate website, schoolmentalhealth.org, which is really intended to put some resources in the hands of clinicians, educators, uh, families, and youth, all related to school mental health. So here we have things like PowerPoints that can be used in pre professional development for educators. They're all modifiable. Everything is in the public domain, meaning it's free. You can access all of it. We have newsletters, for example, that can be downloaded and modified that we send out to teachers, for example, on topics of school mental health. So there's a lot of good uh, resources there that I would encourage you to check out. We do uh, host an na international journal on advances in school mental health promotion, training practice, research, and policy. And we also uh, co-sponsor a national community of practice on school behavioral health. So if you're interested in going a little bit deeper into certain topics in the area of school mental health, this might be a great thing for you to check out. This is actually really the foundation of our national uh, conference that Howard mentioned that we've hosted now for 20 years. Uh, I would encourage any of you to attend. I, there's some flyers out on your tables, but we'll be in a fun place this year. Uh, we'll be in New Orleans. I have to say, with the groundswell here around school mental health, I'm, I'm tempted to consider uh, uh, Nebraska as a place to come for, for our conference because we do move around the country, and I'm just so impressed. <laughs> Yay! I, it's really, I'm, I'm so impressed that there was such a draw. My understanding is that of this morning, as of this morning, there were about 100 people on the wait list just for today's meeting. So consider yourself lucky that you actually made it in. I think it's going to be a great day. And I am so excited to hear about the work that's actually happening here because I think you do have some best practices just from what I was hearing about last night in terms of funding, in terms of service delivery, in terms of connecting education and mental health. So really what's happening here reflects some of the best state-of-the-art practice. Here's a little bit more about our conference. Come join us. It'll be fun. We're going to be getting jazzed about school mental health in New Orleans. So I want to just mention uh, that, you know, often when we attend a conference, we become quite excited. Uh, this is often how we feel as we are in the conference. We get excited about the content. We want to come back. I don't, can you go back to the previous slide? I don't have the ability. You'll have to go onto the video and click there. Rock, rock a point. Right, so that's how we often feel, and my guess is that's how you're going to feel throughout the day today. and as you leave, you're going to be excited to go back to your school, and then sometimes when we return to our school or to our community agency, this is how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> 
right? So we get back, we have all these great ideas, and then the reality hits us, the chaos of our school, the chaos of our agency, the, the <laughs> support we get from our colleagues or the lack thereof sometimes. So it can be really disheartening, discouraging to get all of this great information and then to go back to kind of doing the same old thing. And so I would encourage you to really try to at least identify one or two things throughout the day to day that you commit to, that you can actually make a change, whether it's in your community agency, in your school, in your individual practice, whatever it might be. I encourage you to take at least a couple of tidbits. Just, just keep that commitment after the day because it can be hard. The work that we do is quite difficult and can be hard not to feel like we've been thrown down into a bucket of ice water. So, so I'll leave you, I hope to leave you with a few takeaway messages and maybe one of these will be what you focus on with respect to your commitment uh, to take back to your particular setting. So first, I would encourage you to strategically use both school and community providers to support student mental health and this really requires partnering, which I'll talk about a bit. Education and mental health, we're in the same uh, team and we need to build on each other's strengths. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what our strengths are, but also some of our relative weaknesses and how we can capture each other's strengths in the process. Evidence is not enough, so I am going to speak about how we should be using evidence to support the practices that we do to support student mental health, but I also will touch on just selecting practices that fit and asking the right questions as we select practices to bring in to support student mental health. Implementation matters, we should be thinking about it in terms of both funding and how we can support it for the long haul. And then finally, funding school mental health. My message here is just yes, you can. We need to be seeking diverse funding opportunities that support a full continuum of student mental health care. And I'll touch on what some of those funding opportunities are, but again, mostly th that could be a full day on funding. And I think you're actually going to be getting into some of that throughout the content of the day. So for the most part, I'll just point you to some resources on that topic. So let's start with a definition. So what do we mean by school mental health? And this is how we define school mental health. I'm not sure how it would align with your definition, but let me at least say where we stand. So we, we think about school mental health really as a partnership between schools and community health and behavioral health organizations with our work always guided by youth and families. When we talk about school mental health, we're talking about community partners and other partners building upon existing school programs, services, and strategies. So not community partners coming in to replace existing strategies, but really partners coming in to figure out what's already there and how we can augment existing services, strategies, programs. When we talk about school mental health, we're talking about a focus on all students in general and special education across a full continuum of care, all the way from universal supports to tertiary supports in schools with a full array of programs, services, and strategies. So we are often asked the question, who provides mental health services in schools? There was a national survey done, it's been a few years now, but a national survey indicated that about two-thirds of schools have partnerships with community behavioral health support supports uh, to actually augment what's happening in schools, whereas about a third of schools across the country reported that their school mental health services are provided exclusively by those who are either hired by the school or by the district. Uh, we would argue that community behavioral health professionals do have a critical role to play in terms of supporting student mental health. Not only can they augment services in order to provide a full continuum of care, but there are other kind of unique features of having community behavioral health partners, and I think you're gonna hear about that a little bit more in the panel that comes after my talk this morning. So a couple of the things that we've seen community partners uh, be able to facilitate are reducing some unnecessary or expensive services like emergency department visits or crises by facilitating connections and referral pathways to community partners, by providing preventive care in the school, and also assisting with transitions back to school from more restrictive settings. And I noticed one of the afternoon uh, talks from one of our leaders at Boys Town here uh, is going to be spe speaking specifically to the transition back to the school setting. So it's such a critical role that our community partners can play in this process. And of course, beyond those, what we might consider mental health providers, or student support providers, there are many, many natural providers in this school that we need to be attending to in terms of thinking about what is their role in supporting student mental health, whether it's our educators and teachers, whether it's our school health providers, our administrators, and I'll point you to a few resources uh, that, that will help our natural supports in schools that we've been using, at least in these areas. 
So I do just want to set the stage before I get into kind of the outcomes of school mental health and talk about, from a national perspective, where are we with federal policy, what are our federal agencies uh, considering with respect to school mental health. And I would say that we're at a critical juncture with respect to school mental health. Since I've been at the center, it's been about 15 years, I have never seen this much federal attention to the topic of school mental health and the intersection of education and mental health. Our federal agencies, SAMHSA, the Department of Education, our National Institute of Justice have put out, and you may be familiar with, many, many uh, grants, lots of federal funding opportunities to support school behavioral health services uh, across the country. We've seen tremendous interagency work, both at the federal level, but also at the state level, and cer certainly within many uh, local jurisdictions. We've seen mental health and education partnering in ways that they haven't before. Within uh, the federal agencies, we know that a lot of this has come on the heels of some of the tragedies that have happened around the country, most specifically the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary, uh, where we had a lot of policymakers and legislators acknowledging that we need to not only focus uh, on creating safe uh, schools structurally, but that we also need to look at the resources and mental health supports in schools that can actually prevent incidents from happening. Following uh, that particular incident, the Now is the Time legislation came about, uh, where President Obama came out with legislation indicating that we need to protect our children and communities through school mental health efforts, and those included some of those listed here, including universal screening systems to assess for emotional and behavioral health uh, difficulties in school, equipping our teachers with ways to identify signs and symptoms of mental health, whether it be through youth mental health first aid or other types of systems to train our teachers and we've seen tremendous growth in this area, in part because of some of the federal uh, funds that have come out. Billions of dollars in just the last two years have come out to states and local jurisdictions under things like Project AWARE, Safe Schools Healthy Students, Project Prevent, and IJ's uh, safety grants that have come out. So if you have not yet accessed those resources as a state or local jurisdiction, I would be on the lookout for them because they're a great way to fund some of the school behavioral health activities. So in that context, in the context of what's happening at the federal level, uh, some still may ask, but why should we be attending to mental health in the school building? Isn't that something that needs to be done uh, out in the community within our community behavioral health system? We already have behavioral health systems that are set up. So this is a question we often get asked, and I'm going to try to give you the elevator speech if you are asked this question of kind of what we would say to why mental health in schools. So one of the, the first reasons that we think about is just the fact that um, for a long time, historically, really, the adult mental health system and child mental health system have been artificially kind of bifurcated. So essentially, uh, mental illness was seen as an adult illness, and what happened with children was seen as kind of separate from that. And what is more increasingly acknowledged, I would say, is that actually mental illness really falls along a continuum with the median age of onset happening quite quite early. Uh, with at least half of mental illness uh, occurring by the mid-teens and about three, three quarters occurring by the mid-twenties. And what we also know is that later onset of conditions are mostly secondary conditions to some of these things that happen early on in our young people, and that severe disorders are often preceded by less severe disorders that go untreated. And the reason that I bring this up when I talk about why are schools an important place to actually address student mental health is because Obviously, this is happening early, and schools are a logical and natural place to identify and support students, and we know that early identification and intervention can really change the trajectory for these young people and avoid some of the complications and exacerbated symptoms that can occur if we don't actually identify and intervene early. So let's think about it from a school building level. So if we think about a classroom of about 25 students, and do we have any teachers in the audience? Okay, so a handful at least. Okay, so you may be saying my classroom has 35 students or more. My, so this may be uh, what your classroom looks like, but what we know is that in a classroom of about 25 students, about one in five 
will experience mental health impairment uh, of a mild level. About one in 10 will experience mental health problem, which will cause severe impairment. Okay, so as a teacher, this is something that you might have to contend with in your classroom. But more importantly, less than half of those who actually have a mental health difficulty will receive needed treatment. And what many folks don't know is that most of our children who do receive mental health supports actually receive those supports in the school setting. The difficulty is we still don't know a lot about the quality of those services, and we're going to get into that in a moment. But what we do know is that for students who actually do receive services, which is unfortunately not as many that need it, they receive those in the school setting. So we do need to be attending to providing quality mental health services and supports in the school setting. So why are our young people not getting to mental health services in the community? I want you to think just for a moment. Why are our young people and families not getting the services that they need in the community? So what are some of the barriers? So I'm hearing some. Uh, so my guess is that uh, many of you thought of these here, right? So there are the logistical barriers. I heard someone say transportation up here. Transportation, child care, financial insurance barriers get in the way. When we speak to children and families, and families in particular, they often tell us that it's stigma and poor past experiences with the mental health system that really prevent them from getting the care that they need. And one of the most distressing pieces of data, I would say, within the children's mental health field is the number of sessions that children and families actually make it to with respect to community or outpatient behavioral health care. So when you think about the modal number of sessions, on, on average, how many sessions do you think children and families make it to when they actually do go to mental health care in the community? Who has a number they want to throw out? Two? I heard one. Those who said one are correct. So most families who actually make it in the door to outpatient children's mental health services make it one time. And those are, that's just those who actually make it into the door. So as a system, we have a long way to go in terms of actually engaging and retaining our families in care. And one of the solutions to that that a lot of people are identifying as a practical, reasonable, natural solution is to access them in the places where they already are, their pediatrician's office or their schools as examples. Examples. But there are many advantages beyond just access. So we don't just do everything in schools because that's where they are. There are also other advantages. So beyond access, we find that when children receive mental health supports in schools, there's less time lost from school and also from work for parents. There's also greater generalizability of what's happening in the treatment to their natural context with peers and in their day-to-day -day functioning. For many students and families, mental health supports in schools reflects a less threatening environment to receive care. Students are in their own clinical context. There's actually been some interesting, uh, their own social context, excuse me. There's been some interesting data uh, actually also looking at clinician efficiency and productivity in clinical settings versus in school settings. And we find that in school settings, clinicians see more students or see more, see more children and families and they're more productive. I've never heard of a no-show in a school setting, for instance. I've worked both in outpatient and in inpatient and in school settings. And uh, in schools, you are always busy. I found it very difficult uh, to ever have lunch when I worked in a school, for instance. Uh, I always found the time, but it was often, you know, in the context of lots of people coming in and out of the office. We can also outreach to youth with internalizing disturbances, and this is probably one of the most critical uh, pieces of working in school. So, very often those who actually make it to our outpatient settings are those who are presenting with externalizing or disruptive behaviors. Uh, those with internalizing disorders often go undetected and it takes a long time for them to actually make it to outpatient care. So reaching them in schools and having a system for identifying youth with internalizing disturbances is critical. We have greater access to all youth in the school building so we can do things like mental health promotion and prevention activities and not wait for mental, health, mental illness or mental health issues to reach the point where they need a provider in the community. So these are among the reasons why we would argue that doing mental health in schools is critical, taking these two systems, these two entities, and merging them together. Over the last couple of decades, there's been a, a significant spike in the research that's happening with respect to mental health service provision in schools. We have a long way to go, 
But in general, what the research is telling us is that when done well and when implemented well, we see improvements in social competency, behavioral and emotional functioning, as well as positive impact on academic outcomes. And when we're doing mental health services in school, we always need to be attending to the impact on academic outcomes. There have been good studies demonstrating cost savings. So when we do mental health services in the school setting, we've actually been able to demonstrate cost savings both in the education sector as well as the mental health sector. I'm happy to point you to any of this literature after the talk if you're interested. And also, there's been some work in the area of health disparities indicating that if we actually bring mental health to schools, we are likely to decrease health disparities among our more vulnerable populations. So that all sounds great, so why don't we just do mental health in schools? But not so fast. One of the things that we know is despite the promise of evidence base for mental health promotion and intervention in schools, there is at best, and this is a quote from Lucille Eber who heads up one of our national centers around PBAS and Mark Wiest, there is at best inconsistent and generally limited implementation of empirically supported practices within school districts in North America. And there are a number of reasons for that. We know that the research-based interventions, so where we're having our positive outcomes, we have strong training, we have fidelity monitoring, we have ongoing technical assistance and coaching, administrative support, incentives, some of the intangibles of being part of research studies looking at mental health interventions in schools. But for those of us who are in the trenches doing this work on a day-to-day -day basis, how many of us are receiving that ongoing coaching and training and implementation support? Very often, our work involves limited or none of these supports. So what's happening on the front lines? And we do lots of national surveys and certainly uh, hear the experiences from our colleagues across the country. And so I'm just going to, in a very simple way, highlight some of the good things that are happening in some of the areas where we feel like we have to uh, grow a bit more. So some good stuff, some good things that are happening with respect to mental health in schools. We do see an increased emphasis on evidence-based practice, and we see that as a positive thing, although it has a long way to go, and we'll talk about that. We see an increased emphasis on outcomes monitoring. So increasingly, our mental health providers in schools, both our school-employed providers, our community-employed providers, are being asked to document their outcomes. This is a tremendous challenge for the field right now, uh, but it is good that we're increasing our emphasis on it so that we can actually look at how we're doing with respect to impact on student success. There's increased consideration of culture, cultural context in the development and implementation and evaluation of practices in schools, as well as a recognition of meaningfully partnering with families. And there's an increased emphasis on workforce development of mental health providers and educators, as exemplified by the work that Beacon is doing. There's also some not so good stuff, my simple terms. So first, we know there's limited control and accountability of providers and of services provided. And that really applies across the children's mental health field, but inclusive of uh, the school mental health field. We know there's gaps in training of our mental health and education workforce with respect to supporting student mental health, specifically with respect to evidence-based practice. And you may be wondering why a cow just came onto the screen, and that's because what we often see is what I call cow therapy or crisis of the week therapy, that our practitioners are essentially operating in a very reactive kind of uh, modality. So essentially, they're just reacting to whatever walks in their office, which turns to be turns turns out to be a very crisis-driven process instead of kind of a theoretically or empirically driven process for what works with kids. And so these are areas where I think we have a long way to go, but we're seeing some momentum, some good things. So the challenge, really, one of our challenges as a school mental health field is that there are a lot of good ideas. There's tremendous enthusiasm. Nobody can really argue with the idea that we should be supporting student mental health to promote academic success. We have a list of evidence-based practices that have actually, some, been tested in the school setting. Uh, but we still uh, have not been able to bring these uh, to scale in a way where we can demonstrate positive impact, good implementation, and that's for a lot of reasons. We see implementation is incomplete, it's short in sustainability, we have limited limits in terms of our outcome durability, so we see good outcomes right away and then they fade, and they're narrow in spread, okay? So we have good interventions that are developed, but they may just be implemented in one pocket, one jurisdiction, or one school. 
And part of the reason we think this is happening uh, has to do with what Howard spoke of this morning, the integration of two very distinct systems. So while we know, in theory, it's a good idea to merge mental health and education to support student success and student mental health, we also know that as distinct systems, there are some challenges to actually integrating the two. And so I'm just gonna talk about some of the reasons why this is difficult. So let's start with mental health and how we've tried to integrate mental health into the education system. So you may not be able to see this, but what we have here uh, is a mental health clinician asking the principal, can you help me, Mrs. Martin? This wasn't covered in any of my mental health courses. And there's a classroom of children, it looked seemingly unruly children in the background, but the point here is that we have a lot of very well-intended community behavioral health providers, community mental health providers, who are coming into schools, partnering with schools, but have not necessarily received training in how to work in a school context, school culture, school policy. Now, those who have been trained in school work, our school psychologists, our school social workers, our school counselors, our school health providers, like our school nurses, have so much to offer the community behavioral health partners who are partnering, but oftentimes that doesn't happen. And so what we see are these kind of co-located models where we have community behavioral health come into schools, but not fully integrated into the school setting. And so we're trying to make strides in that area. So another thing that's of concern with respect to the mental health field is just how we actually document success. So historically, as I've already alluded to, in the mental health arena, we have focused very much on productivity, service utilization, the number of minutes we see students, and this is particularly true in the school setting. So we've achieved success, for example, because we've seen Johnny for 30 minutes each week. We have not historically done a great job of documenting our impact on targeted outcomes. Now I know that we've made strides in this area in the last several years, but I do believe we have a long way to go. Uh, we shouldn't just be counting how how many individual sessions have we have? How many group sessions have we have? We need to be documenting how much impact did this have both on psychosocial outcomes and on academic outcomes. Another area within the mental health field that uh, has been a challenge for us is just in terms of how we actually select interventions. So we ask clinicians all the time who are working in schools, well, why did you choose that particular intervention? And we hear lots of answers, among them these. I've heard it work, so I learned it last week, right? I went to a conference, I got excited about it, I was a wild, crazy penguin. Uh, or I liked the packaging, right? And so uh, this is a little bit simple-minded in terms of the answers, but really what this reflects is that we are driven not necessarily by, by what the science tells us or what we already have in the school building. We're very driven uh, by packaging, by marketing of interventions, by what we learn at a specific conference and not necessarily, uh, we're not necessarily going through a systematic process of choosing practices that fit well to support the given needs of our schools. Now I'm making gross generalizations, I understand that. These are broad challenges and I know that people in this room are working to overcome some of these challenges so I hope I'm not uh, offending too many people when I say this is what we're doing as a field because we have seen great things happening in these areas but we still see a lot of of this. So in the mental health field, in school mental health in particular, we lack an implementation structure sometimes to actually be able to choose and implement interventions along a continuum of care, and we haven't historically used data well to inform what we're doing. So I don't just want to pick on mental health. With respect to the education system, whoops, my slides have, there we go. With respect to the education system, very often times, schools will tell us that they are supporting student mental health, that they are actually providing a continuum of care for students and they've got it under control. And sometimes what we find that that means is that they're actually doing well at one tier of the system. So for example, we find many schools who say they're doing positive behavior supports in schools and what they're doing maybe is kind of a universal system of positive behavioral support, uh, but not necessarily implementing it with fidelity or using an incentive system, but not necessarily identifying students with mental health needs at the tier two or tier three level. And obviously this is a humorous way of suggesting that schools sometimes 
sometimes are misusing their incentives when they implement positive behavior systems for children. Uh, another concern that we have in terms of how behavioral health supports are sometimes implemented in the education setting is that we're using outcome measures like discipline referrals, for instance, uh, to actually identify students who have behavioral health needs. That's not a problem in and of itself, but what we worry about is our students like Charlie here, Charlie Brown, who's saying, well, sometimes I lie awake at night and I ask, why am I here? Now, Charlie may not be picked up on with our system of identifying students who need behavioral health supports just via discipline referrals. But as a school system, we've seen many times uh, that the response is, well, he's doing fine because he's not exhibiting behaviors that will lead him to get a referral for discipline, a referral down to the administrator's office. So that's a concern for us. Many times our education systems are implementing, for example, these tier one supports, but they lack the resources or they struggle to effectively implement tier two or tier three interventions for students who may actually be at risk for or who are exhibiting uh, behaviors or symptoms that would warrant kind of more intensive interventions. And then across both education and mental health, I would argue that we still have not done a great job of uh, engaging our community partners and our family partners. And we continue to hear things like, oh, I'm so happy I work in schools because I don't have to deal with families. I hate to even say that out loud, but we hear this from our clinicians. And that really lacks kind of a recognition that engaging families is going to be one of your best ways of actually promoting positive mental health outcomes. We also hear, well, we don't need, from our school providers, we don't need to work with community providers because they don't understand schools. And while there may be nuggets of truth in that, we do see that if we can better integrate our community partners, we're able to provide a more, con uh, more full continuum of care for our students. So those are some of the weaknesses, some of the relative weaknesses. And again, what I would argue is that we need to move towards an appreciation of each other's strengths. And as two distinct systems, we really need to come together and build upon each other's strengths. We need partnerships, right? So this can be quite challenging. But what we know is that schools really are, as I mentioned earlier, the de facto mental health provider for our children. So we can't just keep saying community mental health has that taken care of or schools are going to work in isolation. We know that juvenile, the juvenile justice system really is the next level of system default for our children who are exhibiting mental health issues. And so that's a concern. As child-serving agencies, we need to be partnering up around these issues. We know that factors that impact mental health occur around the clock. They don't just occur at home. They don't just occur in the school system. And it can be really challenging for community providers to address mental health issues that are going on in the school unless they have established relationships. So we know that potential partners must come together to form a more comprehensive system. So let me just give you an illustration of what it can sometimes feel like to actually bring these partners together. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats, don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle, holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, have, you hear the stories, it's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. All right. So who feels like this sometimes when you're trying to bring your partners together, right? It can certainly feel when we're trying to bring partners together at the table from all of our different agencies and our families and our students to inform mental health supports. It can feel like herding cats. This does feel sometimes like what we do at the community level and at the state level as well and at the federal level, frankly, when we're trying to bring our agencies together. But we know uh, that in order to do so, we actually have to pay attention to the distinctions 
connections between these systems, right? We know potential partners, let's just take mental health and education. They have different vocabularies, they have different training traditions, they have experience delivering services in different settings, they have unique perspectives and a unique ability to deliver services. But one of probably the more challenging things is that our mental health folks and our mental health providers who are employed, for example, by schools or the districts, sometimes have overlapping uh, capacity or capability to deliver specific services. And so it can create tension around who is supposed to provide what to whom, and essentially turf wars. So the bottom line is that in partnering with these uh, systems, we need to have frank and open discussions. We need what we call here authentic engagement in the planning and delivery of a comprehensive system. We need to have discussions about who is going to serve whom and how can we best form a comprehensive system rather than step on each other's toes and get in the way. Because I can assure you that there is certainly enough work to be done to support student mental health for all providers to be at the table. One of the resources I do want to leave you with today is something that we've called the Interconnected Systems Framework. It's a relatively simple idea, again, back to this idea of merging systems. But again, uh, it's essentially a process, and it, it outlines for us a process of integrating mental health into the education system across multi-tiered systems of support. I'm going to give you a link to a monograph or a way that you can reach a monograph uh, that essentially defines and outlines ways of bringing mental health into education, the process for doing so, using tiered prevention logic. So many of you are probably familiar with the multi-tiered systems of support, whether it's RTI you use or multi tiered systems or positive behavior interventions and supports. But the idea is that these collective teams will actually use data and partner together to select practices and to identify who will be doing what in a school building and that this is not just a community provider coming into a school to do their own thing, really in isolation of the school entity. So just as kind of to illustrate this, for example, a traditional model might have each school working out their own plan with a community mental health agency. The preferred way, we would argue, is that a district, for example, has a plan for integrating mental health across all buildings and that that's based on both community data as well as school data. A traditional way of doing business might be that a mental health counselor is housed in a school building one day or a couple of days a week to see students. The preferred way is that the mental health partic uh, provider participates in all three tiers in a system and actually uses data to inform what they're doing and to complement our school support staff. A traditional way might be that there's not a lot of data or no data sometimes to decide which interventions to use or to monitor progress of students who are receiving mental health interventions, and the preferred way would be that the mental health person actually leads individual services or groups based on data. And so it's been about a decade, actually, of development of this particular monograph where we started talking with education leaders and mental health leaders in some of our national centers, and then we had sites who really were exemplars at doing this work come together and contribute uh, to the monograph to show us how it can be done, uh, building together mental health and uh, education. So you can find the monograph on our website, on the PBIS Technical Assistance Center website. You can just Google Advancing Education Effectiveness and you'll find the monograph here. But it does provide some really kind of um, frontline examples of how you can do this as well as just a whole set of tools at the end of the monograph that you can use in actually doing this with your community and school partners. So that all sounds good, but you might be thinking, but we still don't know in our own practice or in our own jurisdiction how to identify students, how to select mental health practices. Or you might be thinking, well, we do know how to do those things, but implementation is still not going well. So I'm very quickly going to touch on what some folks across the country are using to do these things, just to give you an appetizer into it. And then again, you can dig a little bit deeper. So identifying students. We hear this question all the time. How do we identify students? students to receive who need behavioral health supports. And some schools have fantastic ways of doing this. One of the difficult things is that many mental health issues might look the same at, at first glance. And so we really do need some systematic way of trying to identify who might need what. Uh, there are many options for screening. 
Some systems just are not in a place where they're going to do any type of universal screening. There are a lot of steps to take uh, to get to that place, but there may be existing data, whether it's attendance data or discipline referral data that you can use to at least identify students that may be struggling with mental health challenges. Uh, you can use ODRs. There are some school districts that are doing a great job of using teacher and sometimes peer nominations uh, to identify students who may be struggling. And then some have systematically integrated measures into uh, identifying students with mental health challenges. Uh, so universal screening using something like office discipline referrals, it will detect some students with externalizing behaviors, but that often depends on the efficacy of the school's referral process. So we have some schools where it really depends on the teacher or the administrator when these referrals are made. And we also know that this type of process alone will not typically catch students with internalizing issues. Uh, in terms of externalizing, internalizing, we need to be paying attention to both. So not just our aggressive or non-compliant behavior or hyperactivity or distractibility or defiance, but also things like our students who are withdrawn or not participating with peers or unresponsive in the classroom, that may certainly be indicative of mental health issues that would warrant intervention. And so there are systems for actually identifying uh, students with those internalizing issues as well, whether it be teacher nomination, where teachers are actually trained through professional development processes to actually understand what is internalizing or externalizing behavior and what is not internalizing or externalizing behavior. This is too small for you all to see, but this is just an example of a teacher nomination form where they're shown examples of externalizing behavior and non-examples. And then uh, in parallel, the same for internalizing behavior. And then they're simply asked within their classroom to rate the top three or the top five students who are exhibiting these issues. And it's a way of narrowing who you might, as a school, as a grade level, actually screen for mental health concerns. Schools may choose to develop their own teacher rating scale, uh, or they may actually use a formal one. This is one that was actually developed out of the Mississippi Department of Education. And and this was simply a checklist where they had teachers fill out all of the students in their classroom and then rate them on some internalizing and externalizing behaviors with a red flag system for when students were over a certain threshold. They were red flagged and then some additional screening or assessment was done. This is a more lengthy one. And we do, obviously, as we're doing this, really have to consider the burden on our teachers of actually asking them to do this type of screening process. So there are a lot of things we have to take into account when doing identification. Many schools now are implementing more formal measures of screening students, things like the systematic screening of behavior disorders or the BEST system. And they have online systems where teachers go in and actually indicate how their students are doing. Again, a way of kind of gatekeeping so that we can ensure that we're not having students with mental health issues falling through the cracks. One resource I do want to point you to, because we get asked this all the time, is, well, what are some free assessment instruments that I can use, whether I'm a school psychologist or a school counselor or a community behavioral health provider working in schools? What instruments can I use that are in the public domain or that are free? Uh, we do have a whole repository on our website of free instruments. So not only do we have the the document that describes all of the instruments and who they've been used with and how they've been used in schools. But then, and you don't have to worry about copying this whole link down. <laughs> uh, you can just go to our website under clinician resources and under free assessments, and you can upload all of these assessments. I think at this point there's about 25 assessment tools. They're all, uh, we're not infringing on copyright uh, at all. These are all in the public domain. Okay, so that's one area that we certainly get asked about a lot at the national level. Now, selecting mental health practices. The good news is we have lots of practices in the children's mental health field and just in school mental health in general that work. We have a number of meta-analyses at this point that indicate that using evidence-based children's mental health interventions is better than just doing usual care or our cow therapy, right, our crisis of the week therapy. When therapists rely on their clinical judgment to determine what to use and how to do it, that's not the best way. Uh, we have good data at this point to suggest that we should be using empirically supported or evidence-based treatments. Uh, there are many, many, and this is just a diagram of some of the evidence-based treatments we use across our 75 uh, schools in Maryland, all the way from universal to tertiary care. Uh, one of the challenges is that there are so many to pick from, and so one of the things that 
we've been trying to work with schools and districts on is to how to make good decisions about the interventions they're going to use because unfortunately what we know is that decisions about interventions in schools are typically not uh, well done. School decisions about mental health interventions tend towards heavily marketed interventions that are compatible with things that they've done in the past. So we like what's familiar to us and that that demonstrates itself in how schools and school providers actually choose interventions. When schools do use evidence-based interventions, we know that unfortunately they're frequently implemented with low fidelity. And so within the monograph I just mentioned, there's actually a whole guide and process for helping schools to select interventions that match their student needs. There's an inventory, there's a process for using data, there's an assessment tool, it's called the Consumer Guide to Selecting Evidence-Based Mental Health Services. And the idea here is really to have our schools and our school behavioral health providers be consumers of practices instead of just being recipients of heavily marketed interventions or practices. We need to be good consumers based on our students' needs. There are many searchable intervention registries. You may be familiar with these, but if you're in a school and, for example, you have students, a number of students with anxiety disorders, or you want to find an intervention for second graders that promote social emotional learning at the classroom level, there are some great registries. There's SAMHSA's NREP, there's the Institute of Education Sciences, What Works Clearinghouse, there's the Annie E. Casey Blueprints Foundation. All of these are searchable in a format similar to this. This happens to be NREPs, where essentially you can say, I'm interested in mental health promotion. I'm interested in the spe these specific outcomes. So for example, drug use or um, uh, dis uh, disruptive behavior. I'm interested in studies that have been done or interventions that have been studied in a specific geographic location, whether it's rural or urban. I'm interested in this specific age group. And it will then spit out to you, here are the evidence-based interventions. Here are the interventions that have been studied in that context with that population. So these are a very helpful way of identifying interventions. I will very quickly mention an alternative to evidence-based manuals because many of us in the mental health field or in schools find it incredibly cumbersome to select be between the over 500 intervention manuals at this point. So as a field, children's mental health has been shifting in some respects to more modular practices. There's been a number of folks who've really been pioneering this effort to essentially look at what are the best practices that are out there, what have been studied in randomized controlled trials, and then what are the elements of those practices. There are some resources you can turn to. There's PracticeWise, which is a subscription-based uh, site. I have no affiliation to it. Uh, many of our clinicians do use this, and we've actually purchased it for some of our programs because it's the best out there that I know of at this point that synthesizes the literature and then provides really friendly, uh, clinician-friendly tools where they can go in and say, you know, I'm working with... Uh, an eight-year-old with disruptive behavior disorders, and I want to know what the best science is for that child. And not only will it give you the manualized interventions that are being used, but it will say, here are the actual specific elements of those interventions that are common across the effective interventions. So for disruptive children, it's praise, it's tangible rewards, it's timeouts. But then it also offers practitioner guides that train the practitioners or kind of walk them through the steps of what to do with children and families. And it offers clinical dashboards so you can map on those types of interventions with outcomes. So I recognize that I'm moving quickly through this. And again, I encourage you to go back and look at some of these things. But I'm just kind of offering some tidbits to think about how you can infuse evidence into the work that you're doing, whether it's through treatment manuals or through kind of just identifying what are the common elements of effective treatments. And these are the algorithms that are put together uh, by PracticeWise that essentially take these elements and help clinicians put them into treatment plans. So we know that selecting students and practices is not enough alone. We know that implementation matters. We can't just select our students and select our practices and try to implement because we see that that's often the biggest failing. There's a significant implementation gap, the gap between identification of an intervention in students and implementation. 
And so what we know, and the, the science tells us that, is that in order to achieve good outcomes for students, we not only need the good interventions, but we need to be really paying attention to effective implementation practices. What we find is that if we don't have proper planning and proper implementation supports, implementation of, of mental health practices in schools often feels like this. So you can go ahead and play the video, Steve. Some people like to climb mountains. I like to build planes in the air. I grew up wanting to be on a wing, wanting to be up this high. Sometimes the temperature up at altitude will reach 60 below. It's crisp, it's refreshing. You never know what you're going to come across up here. Canadian geese, mallards, owls. These people back here, that's why I come to work. That's why I build airplanes in the sky. We're not just building a plane here. We're building a dream. I love this job. I got a lot of thanks up here. When I look over there and I see that little kid, and I look in his eyes, I saw the thanks I need. Okay, so. Got it. So again, we often feel like we're building planes in the sky as we're flying them when we go in and try to do interventions without really taking into account all of the implementation supports that can get in the way if we don't pay attention to them. We know that often we try to implement interventions in schools and we have insufficient funding or initiative overload. The average school, when we've done a survey, a survey of schools nationally to see how many interventions they had to support student mental health, it was 14 separate initiatives in school buildings. That's on average. We have some schools where we have uh, many, many more than that in terms of distinct interventions. And they're not necessarily woven together well. Uh, so there's a number of reasons why implementation science matters and we need to be attending to it. We need to fund it. It's an event. It, uh, it's not an event. Pardon me, it's a process, and we know that without proper implementation support, it can take years and years to actually get good science into the work that we do. If implementation is done on purpose and with appropriate planning and support, we find that at least 80% of interventions can achieve success, but it still takes about three years to do so versus the 17 years without uh, that, that specific attention to implementation support. One of the best resources for how you can support implementation of practices remains this synthesis of the literature that was done by NERN, the National Implementation Research Network. I would encourage you to download this monograph. If you haven't looked at it, it gives you a great summary of here are some of the things you need to pay attention to. I also had the pleasure of working with George Sagai, who leads up the National PBIS Center. Uh, we, as part of the monograph I mentioned, and, and a recent chapter we just did, we came up with an implementation framework, self-assessment that schools can go through as they're thinking about implementing practices in their setting. And so it's just a simple yes-no implementation assessment that if you're sitting down with your community and school partners and thinking about what practices should we be implementing or which one should we be letting go of, this might be a framework framework you can consider. Some key points on implementation. Implementation of innovation, including evidence-based practices, should be incremental and well-planned. And we need to have a leadership group sit down together and really select only a small number of evidence-based practices that yield the greatest impact for our students. So too often, we're seeing schools trying to do too much at once. We need to uh, carefully monitor our practices for effectiveness and efficacy in the building. And practice, this is kind of a key point here that I want you to, to just take with you, that practices should remain in place only as long as they continue to yield the desired outcomes. And that's a simple statement, but we see so many schools who just keep doing the same thing because it's what they've done for a long time, and they're not necessarily demonstrating positive outcomes for our students. So we want to have methods or strategies for actually getting rid of some practices that aren't working and bringing in ones that are. 
So funding school mental health. This was the final question that I was asked to attend to. And what I'm going to do is actually move relatively quickly through some of the, the actual content of this. And I'm going to move to where you can actually get this content at a much deeper level as one of the exciting opportunities I mentioned in the end. We've put together a series of training modules for community-partnered school behavioral health. One of those dives very deep into funding opportunities. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a few key points on funding school behavioral health, but again, I think you're going to get into some of that on the panel this after, or right after my talk, and so I'm excited to hear about what you all are doing to fund school behavioral health because you actually have some quite innovative ways of doing that here. Uh, the objectives within the module uh, that I'm going to point you to are to provide an overview of different funding mechanisms, all the way from federal to local to school building funding that are used across the nation. It reviews best practices in funding community partnered school behavioral health and also provides examples of diverse funding strategies. We get asked all the time, how do we fund this work? We know it's important, we can't figure out how to fund it, we don't know how to sustain it, and we also see a lot of challenges with matching funding streams to the full continuum of care. So we see that some community providers, for example, can fund uh, the tertiary care through fee-for-service, but it's just not enough to do everything that you need to do in schools. And so. We have a lot of good examples across the country of people who have used creative strategies to fund school behavioral health. One of the first things we encourage folks to do is to conduct a comprehensive examination of existing funding opportunities at, at school, local, state, and federal, which we find often, again, we tend to get into patterns of using the same funding streams, but one of the best things we can do is hear from other locale, states, and uh, federal sources what they're doing. Uh, in terms of funding mechanisms, I've already talked about, we go into more depth at each of these levels. At the school level, we've got anything from principal discretionary dollars to private donations. At the local level, we go into more detail about general revenue that you can use, like for revenue for education purposes that can be allocated for uh, school behavioral health services. We see a lot of communities and states who are using a tax line to actually bring in revenue for school behavioral health. I have a couple of examples of those. Private foundations and donors, which I have to say you all are uh, uh, using quite well here. Um, I'm actually quite intrigued by some of the funds that you're using to support school behavioral health. I think we could learn a lot from you. Community businesses are a local source of support. At the state level, our mental health block grants, as well as grant, uh, grant programs to support school behavioral health. I put Minnesota up here as an example because they've worked with their state legislature over the past last five years uh, to actually develop an RFP process where the state funds, through a competitive process, community-partnered school behavioral health to augment what our school providers can do in that state. Many other uh, states are actually having school health centers and school beha behavioral health as a line item in their state budget. At the federal level, there are so many opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's block grants or specific competitive project grants, legislative earmarks, direct payments. There is so much to go into with respect to funding school behavioral health. Here are some examples of the block resources available at the federal level that you could access from your state. I went into some of these examples of competitive grants that are out in the field right now that if you haven't considered applying for, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. Earmarks, this just goes into detail for these federal earmarks that can fund school behavioral health services for up to a year. They're not competitive. And then direct payments, things like fee-for-service, how can we better access Medicaid, for instance, or private insurers to fund at least some of the work that we're doing? Although we know there are challenges to that as well, it certainly does not cover all of the work that we need to do in schools. There are some fantastic examples out, out there of funding school behavioral health. Uh, as an example, Ohio and North Carolina have done a great job of actually designating some of their special education budget towards school behavioral health activities, and IDEA allows for that. It doesn't have to just be used for students who've already been uh, identified as needing special education services. So they've used, for instance, Title I, Title IV, and Title V funding to support social-emotional learning and other universal supports. 
Diverse funding, uh, that is probably the, the most critical thing I can leave you with is to diversify your funding. This is just a survey of uh, funding across Maryland. As you can see, there are lots of uh, different funding streams that go into funding school behavioral health. This is an example of the funding strategy within uh, Maryland, within Baltimore City specifically, where we receive funding from our schools, our substance use, our mental health authority, uh, as well as some competitive grants that we've applied for. The DC public schools are a fantastic example of using seed money from a grant, Safe Schools Healthy Students, and then building local support and sustaining a program for well over a decade now through local behavioral health department funds. Syracuse has a promise zone where they braid together all of these different funding streams to form a $10.5 million budget to support school behavioral health. Again, happy to go into any of these at more, in more detail. Boys Town South Florida uses a tax revenue to support uh, many schools in their system. Diverting students from more restrictive placements can be one way of demonstrating cost savings. We've done this in two large urban districts in Maryland. Be happy to go into more information with you on that. Just lots of ways of uh, saving costs. So I have probably about 30 seconds left. Uh, Anne's down here with the sign and has told me she's going to tackle me and pull me off the stage if I go uh, further. So for those of you who are still awake, the two exciting opportunities I've already alluded to, one is mdbehavioralhealth.com where you can find not only the funding modules, those are actually going to be launched this summer, uh, but you can find a host of other free training opportunities, many of which apply to school behavioral health. We worked with the National Association for School Nurses to develop a whole comprehensive training on mental health for school nurses. There's training for educators on here. All of it's free. There's training on co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. And then this summer, we're launching the community-partnered school behavioral health modules that go into great detail about things like funding, how do you create MOUs, how do you select evidence-based practices, et cetera. These are all the modules. Again, you can find them on the website, uh, on the Beacon website after these are uploaded. We did just put out an RFP. Uh, this is the other exciting opportunity. The thing I should say up front is that the proposals are due June 30th, so I don't anticipate that any of you are going to spend your weekend writing a proposal, but there will be a second round of, of, um, of awardees. And this is for school community districts to actually engage in a national learning collaborative to support quality and sustainability in school mental health. The request for proposals went out. Some of you may have heard of it. They're going to engage in a 15-month learning cycle. But more important, and I know I'm scrolling through these quickly, because even if you don't apply for the RFP, part of the process will be that our center will be putting out a free web-based system where your system can go in and actually enter in, assess yourself in terms of your quality and sustainability of school behavioral health, and get a report kind of feedback system to show how you're doing and what you're doing uh, in terms of school behavioral health. It'll be the SHAPE system, and that'll be launched in about September of this year. These were the takeaway messages. I hope that you'll think for a moment uh, what you can do so that you're not continuing to do the same things, but that you actually do introduce innovation to what you're doing. We all ultimately, no matter what field we're from, whether it's education or behavioral health uh, or some other child-serving system, in the end, we all have the same goal, and that's really just to have successful students. So we might have slow stepping at first, but ultimately, uh, we all want to achieve happy dancing penguins or successful students. And you can go ahead and play the last video if you'd like. This is actually a little video of of what the process sometimes feels like. It's slow to start, uh, but hopefully positive in the end. Thank you. And so thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to sharing the day with you.